Welcome to Thundering Legion, a podcast by and for Armed Forces members covering apologetics, interviews, and news and events from a Christian perspective. Our mission is to advance the gospel to Armed Forces members of all nations and build Christian community for the purpose of mutual encouragement and accountability. Now for today's show. Thanks for joining us for today's episode. We're going to interview Aaron Rosheim. Major Rosheim is a Black Hawk pilot in the Iowa Army National Guard. He supervises aircraft maintenance and also serves on a headquarters staff. During his 19 years of service, he has commanded two companies, an assault helicopter company and an aviation maintenance company, and has served in various leadership and staff roles. He has deployed three times. When not serving in uniform, Aaron enjoys sports, both coaching and playing, home projects, and serving in his local church. He is married and has five children. Aaron, welcome to the show. Trevor, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to make this connection finally. Yeah, absolutely. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about your background and how you ended up joining the military? Yeah, so the military and my, what I would say, the ownership of my faith go hand in hand. Um, I was raised in a Christian home in Iowa and went to church and everything like that. But my faith was very superficial and external and not really something that was ready to handle adversity. And when I went off to college, I was not planning on joining the military. That didn't fit the movie trailer for my life that I had written. Mm -hmm. Uh, My only plan really that I had put together was I was going to play football for as long as I could. Then I was going to coach football for as long as I could. And I would teach and coach and I would be in uh, the football coaches hall of fame. And that would be my, my life trajectory. It was my plan going out of high school. And uh, my freshman year of college, my parents divorced. And that was the first real hardship that I faced in my life. I had never really lost a family member of significance. I'd never really had any hardships up to that point. And all of a sudden, my family, which was a huge piece of my identity, came crashing down. And then shortly after that, uh, football ended. And I wasn't very good, for one. And then number two, I just... It got beat up quite a bit physically, so just the injuries, it was not worth it to be a walk-on anymore. And so football ended. Those are really my two main points of identity. And so um, I really spent probably about a year of just searching. You know, I had no family to sit on and rely on, and uh, my original plan of my life wasn't really there. And so um, I still remember, sadly, uh, praying in that time and saying, okay, God, if you're going to do this to me, I'm taking a break. And, you know, you look back and you think, how foolish was that? Um, Mm -hmm. Thankfully, God was faithful, even when I was struggling. And about a year later, at age 20, I remember a lot of people loving me and caring for me and coming alongside me and then re praying and saying, Okay, God, um, I'm all in, what do you want from me? And uh, sadly, maybe embarrassingly, at age 20 is when I finally decided or realized that life was not about me. In fact, it was about what God could do through me for others. And so when I started praying that prayer intentionally and asking God to show me what he wants with my life um, is when he really put on my heart, the military and the military for me, I, you know, I grew up playing with guns and playing soldiers in the backyard, but again, I never really consider that as part of my plan because that would just get in the way of, teaching and coaching and didn't fit the mold. But once I started being serious about my faith, then I could not stop thinking about the military. And so um, I, I just, I kept saying no, because it didn't fit. And I started feeling like Jonah, where every time I said no, God pursued me more with it. Hmm. I could not avoid it. And so I said, Okay, fine, I'll go talk to recruiters, and that'll be the end of it. Uh, And that just made me more interested. And so, um, to spare some of the long details. Um, I really knew that I still wanted to finish college. That was something that was important to me. I already started and I was already two years into college. And so I looked at options that would allow me to continue that and finish college before I went really seriously into the military. And so um, I ended up settling on the National Guard as a way to do that. And then when I finished my initial training, I took a break from school, went and did my training, came back. Um, And then I realized someone came up to me and said, hey, you're a leader, you should be in ROTC. And I said, Okay, how do you do that? I thought you had to do it for all four years. Um, Turns out no. Um, And so I ended up joining the ROTC program at Iowa State. And I commissioned through there. Um, And through that process, I really got excited for aviation. 
um, and decided I want to do something that will be a, a challenge throughout my entire career. And being an Army aviator was was an exciting option for me and flying helicopters. Um, and then when I commissioned, I actually ended up choosing to stay in the National Guard instead of go active duty because I still had that desire to be a teacher and a coach. Um, and so really, it wasn't until I got serious with my faith that then I said, OK, God, I'm open to your plans for my life as opposed to my plans. Um, and really the way God's moved in that is I've ended up working full time for the National Guard uh, pretty much this whole time, either through um, for the Army or the National Guard. Since I graduated, I've had a little bit of time coaching. Now I coach my youth sports for my kids, uh, but nothing of what I originally planned <laughs> has, has transpired. Uh, and God has really used me in the military. So, um, you know, I think the old adage is if you want to you know, hear God laugh, tell him your plans. <laughs> and yeah. um, but really that the two go hand in hand with my faith development and my time joining the military um, and I would never I wouldn't change it I mean it's been looking back now 19 years it's hard to believe that that went by in a blink um, but oh. since then I, I've just seen God work in so many ways that I would never have expected what specifically drew you to the military and how did God nudge you in that direction yeah, so I think, you know, when I was looking at it, it was 2004. We were a year into the, the war in Iraq. Um, I was already, like I said, two years through college. So I, I was already thinking about it, you know, being a healthy, you know, athletic male in America. And I felt like there's no reason I shouldn't join or I can't join. I should serve my country. And so I felt like I needed to contribute to that. And then through that, as I, like I said, with joining and growing my faith in that same process, I really felt like finally I was listening to God's plan for my life. And really now even more so when I can look back and piece these things together, God had already grown me through sports and activities to be a leader. He'd already grown me to be a competitor, to be a teammate. And so all those things naturally fit for the military. I just didn't see it at the time because I probably because I didn't want to, and I wasn't looking for it. And so the nudging of that was a lot of just, the more I prayed, the more God put that on my life and my heart. Um, and I've, I've never heard God speak out loud to me, but I feel like through just reading the, the Bible and spending time with believers and godly men that were influencing my life, and even just through... Um, not to get overly charismatic and spiritual, but through a dream, I felt like God said, this is a way to go. Um, so that became a fit for me and it's, I've never regretted it. So have you seen God working in your successes and failures throughout your military career, maybe in leadership positions, combat deployments, that sort of thing? Yeah. So right away, because I was serious about my faith going into it, I wanted to be used by God. And so when I first joined I mean, you go through basic training, you go through the initial stuff. I mean, they shave your head, you're a nobody. Um, so it wasn't me outwardly, you know, looking for ways to share my faith or to, to do anything like that. Uh, it was a lot of consumption. And so from the, at the early stages, it was just, okay, I need to get through this training. Um, mm -hmm. And then still just trying to figure out what God wants to do with me. And so at initial entry training or even my advanced training for an individual job skill, there wasn't a whole lot of me you know, helping others in the sense of I'm not, I wasn't leading a Bible study or anything like that. I was just trying to encourage people as I went. Um, there's a lot of openness to faith at basic training, just because everybody's in the same stressors and the same adversity. Uh, but it wasn't really until I got back on campus in the fall and started doing ROTC. Um, there was a couple of friends in my class that we started trying to meet and talk about faith. And, and that was helpful, maybe just as an encouragement to each other. Still didn't really click on that vision. The following summer, I went to airborne school for the Army, so jumping out of airplanes. I thought I was going there to learn how to parachute out of airplanes, but God really sent me there to teach me how to be intentional about sharing my faith because mm -hmm. I met and ran into and, and built a relationship with these guys who were part of the Navigators, which is a military and collegiate ministry. And those guys, they just poured into me for three weeks. They spent time with me. They showed me just how to be intentional about sharing the Bible. And I had already started helping with some 
high school students and helping lead a small group, but I didn't really understand about intentionally sharing my faith and helping someone else in what would be, you know, now I can call it discipleship. I didn't know that's what it was called at the time, mm -hmm. but a discipleship mindset. Um, that's what the navigators are really known for. And so that really inspired me to do that more. And so my last year of college and ROTC, I really, we kicked that off even more and we continually worked and built this consistent Bible study that met with ROTC students. And that's still going on today, which is cool to see. Wow. But that was really the start of it was, it was more than just consuming for my own growth. But I realized for the first time that, you know, wow, God could use this as I inspire someone else to grow in their faith too. And so that's really, I think, um, I would say at airborne school in 2005 was when I really hmm. started seeing that vision of, you know, you could use your military position and career for this. Um, that hasn't always been perfect. I mean, there's certainly times where I've cowered away from opportunities to share, um, maybe a fear of, well, I don't want someone to think I'm using my position unduly or, you know, to proselytizing when I shouldn't in uniform or whatever. But at the same time, there's been so many opportunities that I've been able to meet with soldiers and in, in a deployed environment or even just here and spend time with people and encourage them and, and use my faith to encourage them and share with that and help them grow too. So that's been a, a unique feature of, of that. And I think really overall, just seeing that, you know, God wants to use all of us in whatever career path we are. Um, not everybody's called to vocational ministry, but I think uh, listening to Fang on one of the previous podcasts, he said it too, of just, we're all called to ministry. And then um, how do we do that? You know, what job has God intentionally placed me in? What leadership position? What group of people am I around so that I can share in that moment? And I've really always felt like the military is one of the last unreached people groups. And so it's our job as believers in the military to bring the light of Jesus to this place, to these people, um, just as if we were going to some unreached tribe, you know, and hmm. the military can be a pretty dark place and that needs the love of Jesus from all ranks, you know, the, the lowest enlisted to the highest leaders. And I think that's a, a calling for all of us that continue to serve or that think about serving. What were some of the kind of the, maybe the more specific or practical things you learned in that time and then specifically treating, you know, the military as an unreached people group, what does that look like to actually live that out? Yeah. So I think just from a practical standpoint, those guys, I mean, first of all, I met this guy named Chuck, who's just a tremendous mentor of mine. And, and he was just standing outside the chapel at the airborne chapel and said, Hey, do you want to come into service? And I said, yeah, sure. I had nothing else going on on a Sunday. So I went in there and then, um, you know, we got to meet and talk and then we went out to lunch afterward and just that life on life sharing and just getting to know me and just sharing the word of God and the passion for God's word was key. And then really, I just think of, you know, in the book of James, it talks about not just being a hearer of the word, but be a doer of it. So we can't just be a consumer of scripture. We need to go out and apply it and do it. And really, if we're going to be like Jesus, Jesus went out and shared with other people and loved them. So we can follow that example too. And so I think that's just a key couple of practical things of just demonstrating for me what living out this faith publicly and caring for others and then applying that even to a leadership role you know, as, a, as, a, as a small unit leader or a company commander um, or now as a supervisor of people that I need to lead them like Jesus would first, whether or not we ever have a conversation about the gospel, they should see and experience Jesus through my actions. And then when the conversations are there to, to, you know, use those as a chance to share that and encourage more specifically. And so I think that's some things that I learned through and from the navigators and, um, you know, even going on beyond college and going to flight school, uh, at Fort Rucker, Alabama, where there's a really good navigators Bible study, um, which a guy named Perry runs that and he calls it the Fort Rucker seminary. So, you know, we go there to learn to fly, but he he's there teaching us and walking alongside of us as we go through that 12 to 15 months and, and just caring about us and showing us, Hey, this is great. You're going to be a good pilot, but what about your faith and what about the word mm -hmm. of God and what are you doing with that in your life and in your family's life and in your units? 
and what does that look like? So there's a lot of good people out there that are encouraging that, that have really influenced me in that way. So why do you think the military is an unreached people group? So I think, you know, the military in general brings in everybody from society and from the highest of highs, to the lowest of lows, all demographics, all socioeconomic demographics are matched in the military and the military itself in general can be probably classified as a fairly spiritually dark place. And there's just a need for Jesus, you know, across the ranks and to encourage people that way, to give people a larger sense of purpose and hope. Um, certainly there's, um, believers in the military, obviously you and you and I are examples of that, but the, the idea there is that by and large, and maybe you've seen this too in your time is just, you feel alone a lot as a believer mm -hmm. and, um, the adage of, you know, there are no atheists in foxholes is not really true. Um, there's a lot of them in the foxholes. Mm -hmm. And I think there's just a heightened sense of life and death and, um, the thoughts of like, well, what would happen if I don't make it generate more conversations, which is good. But I just see that as a, as an opportunity that the military is many ways across cultural ministry. There's a separate language, a separate tradition, separate cultures we have to learn. And it uh, just becomes a, an opportunity to live life among these people, if you will, and to try to live the customs, live the courtesies, the language, and then share the love of Jesus in that. Yeah, definitely can relate to, you know, the, the military feeling like a dark spiritual place and feeling alone at times. I think especially in the last several years with all, all the stuff with COVID and everybody getting locked down and all that sort of thing, um, which is really the reason why started kind of this, this podcast is to try to learn from other people and connect to other believers in the military. So hopefully this encourages other people that there are other believers out there. And uh, we want believers in every organization in the military because it's going to bring the light of Christ into the military. Um, so you had mentioned that you started uh, an ROTC Bible study, what, 19 years ago or something like that? Yeah, um, really. Can you kind of talk about uh, that, what prompted you to do it, what that looked like and where it is now? Yeah. So when I was a senior in ROTC at Iowa State, there were a couple of friends with me that we were in the same class together, or maybe a couple of underclassmen that we were believers. And like you said, sometimes it's hard to find other people. But when we look for it, um, oftentimes we do find maybe one or two other people. And so um, for us, there was maybe four or five of us that got together. Another cadet of mine, her name was Molly. And she and I um, just started talking about faith one day and saying, you know, we should really just get people together. And so we started mm -hmm. offering this. Uh, we initially started off with watching the band of brothers. And so we'd watch mm -hmm. a, one of the one hour episodes, and then we would spend some time trying to apply that to faith and service. And that's really what kicked it off that, um, she would make brownies for the group. We'd watch an hour episode and then we'd try to tie that into spiritual concepts. And then it became this weekly thing where we just gathered and said, okay, we're going to meet once a week. Um, then when I left and went to flight school, it continued with a, a few people that we handed that off to. And then I actually ended up coming back from flight school to the Iowa guard and then ended up working at Iowa state, um, in the department, the ROTC department, uh, for pretty much 12 years. I was there as a first an instructor, then the recruiting officer, uh, while I still served in the guard part-time. And while I was there too, just keeping that going um, and really feeling like, okay, God put me back in this job for a reason. And so I want to grow this ministry and to encourage, to make it cadet led. And so we ended up expanding to all the branches, the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines. Um, so really it became this, um, this cadet run ministry that I was just there to encourage and, and to facilitate. And it still goes on today, even though I've moved on from that job and um, so it's just something that we felt like it was important to have an option mm -hmm. for military minded students on the university campus. And uh, because we don't fit in necessarily on a normal university campus, there's just different focuses with the military and trying to fight that loneliness as believers. And so that became a, a focus and just trying to 
make that happen. And so now it's, it's partnered with the navigators, but it's also partnered with crew. Uh, crew is the campus ministry that then feeds into officer Christian fellowship or OCF. So many people out there serving as officers in the military probably have heard of one or both of those ministries. And so now it's, um, the ROTC ministry of crew is called valor. Um, and that's on several college campuses around the country and specifically focuses on ROTC ministry and the navigators and valor are partnered together to try to reach the most number of ROTC students as possible. Um, interestingly, valor, I was told that, that we actually called our group valor way back in 2005. Uh, and I was told that hmm. crew took that name and used it and say, and gave us credit saying, Hey, Iowa state was the first valor group, uh, in well. this ministry. So. I guess that's kind of a, a neat feature of that, but yeah, I just need to give some, give an option to people who are in the military, uh, much like what the chapels do out on military posts. And then the navigators and OCF are doing for officers out in the military. You can pretty much go to any military base or post probably worldwide and find somebody that represents one of those two ministries, which is great. Uh, do you have any cool stories or connections uh, from doing that ministry that you've seen God really working through it? Yes, definitely. I mean, just the opportunities to share, obviously, about the Bible and, and then being able to invest in young cadets and midshipmen's lives, um, really as a sending ministry to send them out into the military and to be able to, um, you know, really, it's, it's like sending them out in the mission field and just mm -hmm. saying, you know, here's how you should lead like Jesus and go out and do it. And then following up with them over the years and you know, one example is Ben, our mutual connection and being able to invest in him in that time while he was in college and then went out into the Air Force and, and has served and, and been a leader and an aviator and then being able to see his faith growth still over the years and keep that investment going has been really rewarding to see. And then trying to be a connector, you know, where someone like Ben can say, hey, I'm going to this base. Do you know anybody? And being able to touch into that database and say, yes, look for this person and, and make those connections, I think is so helpful because like we said, it's, it can be really lonely going to these, you know, quote unquote wildernesses or deserts. The Bible talks about that a lot for mm -hmm. the key characters, almost all of them spend time in the desert or the wilderness and God uses that to grow us. But in many times a key figure comes alongside us in those desert periods to really help us grow. And to use, God uses them in that way to do that. I've seen that theme across several other podcasts and, and also just in my personal studies lately of, of that wilderness adventure and that wilderness journey that we all have to go through of, of self-discovery. And I uh, just read in Deuteronomy 2, 7, says, The Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. He has watched over your journey through the vast wilderness. These 40 years, the Lord, your God has been with you and you have not lacked anything. Um, just reading about the Israel going through the wilderness, God guiding them, and then also connecting that to a lot of the other wilderness journeys we read about throughout the Bible, whether it's uh, Israel, Abraham, Jesus going out in the wilderness. I think that's uh, just something that we all have to come to grips with, that we're going to all go through our wilderness experience. And God is using that in order to refine us and to grow us closer to him. So what are some things you kind of learned from going through your own wilderness journey, watching other people go through the wilderness journey of how to keep your focus in the right place during those times? Yeah. So I think that that theme is all over scripture. And I even think of, you know, when I think of the wilderness, I think of, you know, just feeling alone, um, feeling disconnected, whether it's from family or friends, uh, feeling the, the challenge. I mean, a deployment is oftentimes one of those wilderness periods. Uh, it's, probably no coincidence that the army, we always get sent to some desert or barren wasteland is where the army usually puts up a base. And so that's where I've always spent my time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's always away from my family. It's always, you know, just a challenge because of that. And sometimes I think our wilderness periods in life are self-induced because of our own sin. And so mm -hmm. we sometimes find ourselves in a wilderness where we feel disconnected because of our own choices. So I think the first part of that is to figure out well, why am I here? Like, God, what do you have for me? And maybe it's a chance to repent, but it's also an opportunity to draw closer to God and to really lean into him. And I think of even Elijah and his story. You know, you think of Elijah who had this super high moment of 
heroically, you know, calling down fire from heaven. And then the next chapter, we find him hiding in a cave, you know, just running for his life. Like after he had just called down fire from heaven, <laughs> and then we find him in a cave hiding. And he's basically blaming God. Like I'm here because you are not helping me and I'm all alone. Everybody else is dead. It's all me. And I haven't, I haven't, don't have anybody else to rely on and really feeling sorry for himself. And in that moment, God was patient and whispered to him and basically said, actually, there are a whole bunch of faithful men and women, and I'm actually going to send you to find one of them. His name is Elisha. And so in that wilderness, God met him there for one. And the second part of that is God reminded him there are other faithful men and women out there. You just need to be looking. And then third, go find one to invest in. And so I think the takeaways for that, even in my own life, what I've seen is when I'm feeling sorry for myself because I'm stuck in a wilderness, maybe I'm deployed away from home, or maybe I'm just feeling disconnected. My response to that needs to be to reach out to God and connect with him deeper and say, what do you want from this? Because he's, this isn't an accident. I just didn't just find myself on a deployment. God intended that to happen because he's in control. So then I need to figure out what does he want from me? The second part of that is, I think, to remind ourselves that there are other faithful men and women out there. Go look for them. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing is, who can I invest in? Because if I just feel sorry about myself all the time, it's all about me. I'm not even thinking about fellowship or even discipleship. Maybe I could help somebody else out here, too, that's feeling the same way that I am. Mm -hmm. And so on every one of my deployments, I've, I've really gone through those stages where I felt, you know, woe is me. This is, this is not fun. I have to leave my family. But then when I get my feet underneath me, I can start looking around and saying, okay, where is the fellowship? I'm going to go connect into the chapel right away and see if they have any offerings. Is there a Bible study I can connect with? Is there a group of people who look faithful? On my last deployment, I just said, okay, we're just going to start something. If there's nothing here, I'm just going to start something. And so I looked around the chapel service and I found a good friend of mine now, I didn't know him at the time, but he was this Marine Corps officer across the way. And he looked like he was intentionally like connecting with worship. Like he was into it. And I said, I'm going to go find that guy because I'm going to talk to him after chapel service. I bet hmm. he wants to connect in fellowship too. And sure enough, now he's one of my good friends and, and we were able to partner together and invite others to come to a Bible study. And, and that became a really good thing um, in that wilderness place. And so that I think is just the huge component of that idea that we can't just go through these periods and just be like, well, this is a terrible time of life. God still wants to use that. And probably God intended it and planned it. So what could I learn from it? I think is that key piece. So uh, let's say somebody is listening. They feel kind of isolated. They want to start some sort of community of Bible study. Uh, what does it look like to get connected with somebody to get that started initially? Maybe how do they decide what they want to focus their studies on and how do they structure it to make it accessible and just like a fruitful time of, of connection with others? Yes, great, great question. So I would say that like this Elijah example from First Kings, God didn't tell Elijah, go start a really big, complex ministry. God directed Elijah to go look for Elisha and find one man. Um, and so I think it starts with one, right? Where if I'm alone, if I'm on a deployment or I'm on a training or I'm just away from my normal connection, um, just pray for one other person that you might connect with. And maybe that's a, a spiritual peer. Maybe it's a spiritual kid or junior that you can invest in, but just pray for one person to start with. And then see what God does with that. That might become the focus or that may become a the first two people of a small group ministry. Um, I think also check and see what else is out there. You know, if we're here in the local and the state side, uh, find a good local church, find a or go serve at the chapel on post. Um, same thing on a deployed environment or gone at a TDY at a training event. Um, connect in with fellowship that's already existing, you know, look online and see what the chapels offer. Maybe they already have a chapel Bible study. Maybe they have a 
navigators or officers Christian fellowship type group that's meeting um, either there or in a house or something and connect in with it and see where you might serve um, already that's already existing. But if you find yourself isolated and you just feel like there is nothing out here, there's not even a chapel. Um, I've certainly been in places that I've been really remote where I felt like there is nothing going here. So, okay, God, what, what do you have for this? And give me one person that I can come across. Um, and one example on my second deployment, it just felt, it really felt disconnected. Um, we had just moved to a new location and it was, we're reopening a place and there really wasn't even a chapel. Um, and so I just, one night I was out on the flight line and there was this army, I think he was a lieutenant at the time and he was just standing there and I said, Hey, do you need help finding something? And he was waiting for a passenger to come off one of the rotator flights. And so we just started talking and I heard that he went to Biola university. So I knew right away, I was like, you're a Christian because it's, it's a Christian college. And he said, how mm -hmm. did you know that? I said, well, I'm familiar with Biola. We should talk more because I right away, I was like, okay, God, you answer my prayer. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so we became friends and we ended up regularly getting together just to encourage each other and just to pray for each other. And that was the start. And that's really all it ended up being because we didn't have the schedule or the ability to create something bigger. It was just whenever we could, Hey, I'll see you at the dining facility. And, and cause he didn't, he wasn't a pilot, so we weren't doing the same job as we just would cross paths every now and then. Mm -hmm. And we would get together and encourage each other and pray. And that has continued to this day to the point where he was driving across the country about a month or so ago. And he stopped just to get lunch and we got to do the same thing, just like we were, we were when we were deployed eight years ago together. Um, so I think that's just the starting small and not trying to feel like I have to do too much. Now, if, if the opportunity is there to start a Bible study, I would just keep it really simple and just say, Hey, let's gather together, whoever wants to be here and then build on that and say, invite your friends. But all we're really going to do is pick one of the, you know, not, I guess you don't want to call any book in the Bible easy, but starting with something like the gospel of John or the book of Romans and just saying, we're going to take a chapter. Every time we get together, we're going to read through a chapter together and we're going to talk about it. This isn't going to be about teaching theology. This is just going to be me facilitating this and we can keep it simple. Let's just go head, heart, hands. What does this make me think? What does this make me feel? And what should I do about it? And it doesn't have to be complex. And it's mostly about the community aspect of it and the encouragement and then certainly pointing people towards Jesus. But I think not putting the pressure on it to be, you know, I'm, this is not going to be some sort of deep exposition of scripture and, and, and maybe that, maybe that could be, but my experience has just been, let's keep it simple. Let's be about the fellowship. Let's pray for each other. Let's crack open the Bible and let's try to grow in this time. I've heard that head, heart, hands thing come up several times lately, but I've never heard it specifically applied to reading scripture and then going through those steps of thinking about how does this impact me? How, what do I know about this? How does this impact my heart? And then what should I do about it? Um, that's, that's cool. That's something I'm going to take forward now as I think about my daily studies. Um, so for your military career, I mean, what are some of the biggest failures or struggles you've kind of gone through and walked through that you've seen God working in? Yeah. So I think, you know, anytime you serve in the military, you've got successes, you have disappointments, um, you know, you get overlooked for promotion, um, or you don't get an assignment that you want, or, um, you know, maybe just having conflict with people, you know, as a leader, you always have personal conflict you're working through, just dealing with issues. Um, and I think, you know, there's been times where I feel like I should have done more from a spiritual standpoint, since we're on a, on a faith-based podcast, I think that's where I'd probably classify most of the failures where I just feel like, mm -hmm. oh, I totally missed that softball that God threw me. Um, but ultimately I have to remind myself that it's not up to me. If it were up to me, I think we'd all be in trouble. Um, but thankfully God does his work despite my efforts to, um, try my own way or do, you know, just miss his leading. And so I think a lot of that is relational. I would say it would be the failures that I just miss opportunities to really invest in people from a spiritual perspective. 
Um, maybe it's out of fear. Maybe it's just out of busyness where I just completely miss it. Um, or maybe I'm just not connecting with God enough or trusting him enough. And so I rely on my own ability. And, but I think that also gives him more room to be the hero of the story mm -hmm. because I naturally struggle with pride. So, um, anytime that God can push me off the stage and he can get the spotlight, uh, which should be all the time, by the way, um, yeah. is a good thing. And so even when I feel down as if I missed something, then God comes and reminds me in those moments that it's not up to you, man, I got it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's reassuring. Um, but yeah, otherwise I think there's certainly disappointments where you feel like, Oh, well, why did, why did he get picked for promotion? And I didn't, or I wanted that job or I wanted that assignment or that I wanted to fly that aircraft, whatever that may be. Um, or I, why am I getting stuck on this deployment? Somebody else could go. And there's all those types of moments where you just feel like, well, this is a huge letdown. This was not my plan. And really the theme of my story is pretty much whatever God's doing is never part of my original plan. And it's always his. And I don't notice that until after the fact I look back and reflect and realize that, wow, um, I would have not done it that way, but I also would have missed so much of what he intended. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit about the, the Bodgrams Instagram and how yeah. your small group kind of grew into that? Uh, Cause that's how I right. originally connected with you. Yeah. So through that ROTC ministry that I was running, I just, you know, I feel like God always puts me with these fringe people that probably would never step foot in a church. Um, but mm -hmm. I'll, I'll strike up conversations with people. And part of that is also, you know, for me, I've, I've considered the chaplaincy, but I've resisted it just because I feel like I have more of an opportunity with people who would never talk to me if I had a cross on my chest. And I have that opportunity to influence them and impact them and relate to them. And then they're shocked when they realize, wait, you're a, you're a Jesus follower. It's like, yeah. And so I, I just had a lot of those guys around me back in 2016, 2017. There was this group of, of cadets who were not part of our Bible study, but knew about it. And they knew that I was you know, in charge of it. Um, so they knew where I was coming from. But at the same time, it was much more um, just I just want to be a, a good mentor to them and care about them and get to know them. And so um at one point, I remember having this conversation with a couple of these guys and I said, hey, um, do you think you would consider doing a verse of the day with me? And both these guys were big time CrossFitters. And so they always talked about the WOD, the workout of the day. Hmm. And so I said, what if we just called it the VOD and did the verse of the day and we'll just do a group text. And so I will, I'll send out a text to you two guys. And we'll, I'll just say, hey, here's the verse of the day from the YouVersion Bible app. That's what we started with. We just Because when you open up the YouVersion Bible app on the homepage, it has the verse of the day. So I said, let's just use that. Let's keep it simple. And um, I'll just send you a couple of thoughts about it. You guys can chime in. It became this group text that went back and forth. And you know, each one of them would say, well, I want to add this guy. He's one of my friends. Like, okay, sure. And so it became this group text of whatever the max is on an iPhone. I don't even know, maybe 20. <laughs> Um, yeah. So we were just texting and I would just initiate it every morning. Well, then I was getting ready to deploy in the winter of 2017. And several of those guys didn't have iPhones. So I couldn't iMessage while I was overseas. And I was trying to figure out, well, how? So I was asking them, I said, hey, how are we going to do this? If you want, if you want to keep this going. And so one of the guys said, well, you should just start an Instagram page. And I didn't have an Instagram account. I, I try to stiff arm social media and keep that at bay. Um, and so I, I didn't have anything like that. And he said, well, just start one and then you can just post on there. And so I reluctantly agreed, but then I didn't realize, well, now I have to be creative. I have to create some sort of image because you can't just put, you know, a blank square with words on it. That would be kind of boring. So, so God has really stretched me with my creativity through this because I also didn't feel like I could just steal the pre-made images off of you version Bible app. I felt like, well, that's kind of like an infringement of, I don't know, even though they provide them, but I just said, I'm not going to do that. So it became this thing where now almost 
five and a half or six years later, um, I'm still doing this a verse of the day. Um, and so really what it has, it's grown into way more than I ever thought it would be, uh, because I just wanted it to be something to keep in touch with these guys and keep encouraging them spiritually. And what it became is just this, you know, all I am doing really is posting a thought or two from my own personal daily quiet time. Uh, so it keeps me accountable. It helps me grow my faith because I'm thinking about this stuff and just typing it out. It makes me more creative. I guess it connects with people. There's people on there that I don't even know um, that are interacting with the daily posts. Uh, it's kind of how we connected a little bit. Um, and so it's been really neat to see God do that. But I always tell people and kind of jokingly, but I guess seriously too, that, you know, this audience is just a whole bunch of spectators to my own personal quiet time. And um, if nothing else, it's keeping me consistent and accountable to being daily in my own reading in the Bible yeah. so that I have to do something. Cause otherwise I'll feel guilty if I don't post something every day. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's really what it's grown into. And I, I don't know where it goes from here. I don't know if it, how long it continues. Uh, I talked to my wife somewhat regularly and just said, I'm just going to stop doing this. Cause I, I don't know. I, it just becomes, sometimes it becomes a burden just because I don't, I don't, I definitely don't want it to be about me. I want mm -hmm. it to be about the word. And, but then, you know, one of those guys from the original group will like one of the posts. I'm like, oh man, okay, they're still here. So I got to keep it going. So it, it, yeah. that's just, that's what it has grown into. And I, I just figure, okay, God, you just, you stop it when you want me to stop it. And otherwise I'll just keep it going. Mm -hmm. And I just try to get up in the morning and have coffee with Jesus and then post some thought about it sometime during the day and have a, have it out there. It's amazing how God can use those little consistent efforts and really grow them into something that you never anticipated. Yeah. And that's, you know, we, we start off just calling it the VOD. And then one of the guys, I just said, well, I don't even know what to name this. And he said, well, just call it VOD grams. And so <laughs> that's what it, that's what it became. And so that's where, that's what it is. So it's pretty straightforward, but yeah, it's uh, nothing spectacular and I'm definitely not John MacArthur, but I just put my amateur photography and my amateur thoughts to the test and try to make some sense of a verse every day. Yeah. Well, God's word can do amazing things, uh, even through simple people like us, you know? Definitely. So where, where do you think God is leading you next? I, I know you're, you're at 19 years. Are you getting ready for retirement? What's your plan going forward? I mean, I'll be, I'll be at that point next January, which is crazy to think. And I never planned on this going into it. I just thought I'll just do my initial, you know, enlistment first and just see what happens. And then uh, when I became an officer, then I said, okay, I'll be a pilot. I want to pursue that. And that added a, you know, six year commitment at the time. Now it's a 10 year commitment for the new people. Um, but I, I just figured, okay, I'll just serve this six years. And then I figured, well, I, I definitely want to be a company commander and I, I'll get through that period of time and, and see where I'm at. Um, and then I did a second company command. Um, and now I, I work full time for the guard. So my, my, I'm not two different incomes. I'm a singular source. Like this is my full-time career now. Um, and so I would, if I could script it again, we heard the beginning of this podcast, so I should not publicly state my plans because God's just going to change them. But my current plan is to, to probably do this for, um, you know, 11 or so more years until I hit my mandatory removal date where the military kicks us out as commissioned officers. And then I don't know, I don't know what I'll do. Cause I'll only be, um, 52 when I hit that mark. So I'll have to do something differently. I can't just sit my, my wife knows that I can't just sit at home and I'll be busy with something. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll go actually start teaching and coaching. Maybe I'll go into more full-time ministry. Maybe I'll be a pastor. Um, maybe I'll continue flying. I don't know. Um, but at, at this point, I feel like God has put me here and that what's transpired to get me into this position. And I think he's got a, a purpose for me here doing this mm -hmm. and taking care of these people that he's put underneath my care. And so I'll do this until he changes it. I always call that spiritual inertia. So yeah. the laws of inertia, if something's in motion, it will continue in that unless something you know, acts upon it. I was a history major, by the way, so don't start quoting physics. I mean, you're probably an engineer or something. Uh, but that, that concept, I think, is good that, okay, hmm. as long as I'm doing what I think and I'm seeking what God wants for me, uh, then I'm, I think I can continue in that direction until he acts upon that and changes me. Uh, the key mm -hmm. is to be open to that and, and go through life without 
my eyes closed and my ears plugged. Oftentimes I think we say, well, I never hear from God, but then you want to reach up and pull the people's fingers out of their ears and say, Hey, if you start listening, <laughs> um, but we, so I, at this point, I feel like God's got me here and I'm going to stick with this for now. And so, yeah, I'll probably, I'll probably hit 30 years of service before it's all done. Unless something wow. changes. I mean, they awesome. pay me to fly, so I can't, I can't complain. So right. it's a pretty good job and I've got good people that I work with and that work for me. And so I, I like it. So what book of the Bible do you go to in times of difficulty? Oh man. Um, my favorite chapter hands down is Romans eight. And to me that really hits almost every need that we could face. Um, and so you think of when I face times of need, I, f- I feel like, okay, am I, am I distant from God? Am I, is God near me? Is he with me? And you just go right to Romans eight at the end where it's like, nothing can separate me from the love of God and nothing on this planet, nothing outside of this in the spiritual realm can separate me from God's love. And so that's always reassuring. Um, and there's a purpose behind that. So to me, I, I would always point to that. Um, my life verse is Galatians 2.20. So identifying with the crucifixion of Christ, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. This life I now live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and died for me. And so when I, I still remember interacting with that verse. Um, I mean, I read it as a kid or whatever, but it really never hit me until basic training. And I was reading my Gideon New Testament Um, I just decided to read that cover to cover because it really had nothing else to read at basic training. Um, And I still remember coming across that on the page and pausing and even just getting choked up a little bit. Like, this is it. Like, this is my verse. This is what God is speaking to me in this verse. I just felt like, you know, that just lit a fire inside of me that Mm -hmm. that old Aaron is dead and you're new and it's you are just this vessel carrying the love of jesus uh, with you and so that's that's been my theme verse as a reminder that hey things are hard but guess what um you're you're experiencing this for jesus you're here with these people to bring them the love of jesus so endure stick with it Mm -hmm. so speaking of the love of jesus uh Do you have any words of encouragement for others who might be feeling isolated or struggling in their faith? Yeah, I would, I mean, I would just say, like Jesus even said, you know, keep asking, keep searching, keep knocking, and we will find him, you know, he will reveal himself to us in that. Um, The other thing I would say, you know, John 14, 21, the idea of relationship with Jesus is based on obedience. So, Sometimes we need to check ourselves and look in the mirror because that distance is often caused by our own sin. And so we have to really reset ourselves and repent um, because then is when Jesus says, hey, I'll show up and so will God and this will be a relationship. And and that's a huge piece of it. But that's the other part of it. I, I was living in religion growing up and God always felt distant. And I never really knew that the true meaning of relationship with God until I was 20 and I got really serious about my faith. Um, and that's when I realized that the relationship side of it is very personal, is very connected, uh, but it still requires me to drive toward God and run toward God, draw near to God and he'll draw near to us. You know, the James talks about that. So Mm -hmm. that's what I would say to anybody that no matter where they're at on that spiritual spectrum, you know, if they're a non-believer, well then lean into it, research it, study it, learn and figure out what that means. And what, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? Is he real? And mm-hmm. and what does that look like? And then if someone is a believer, but just feeling stagnant or nominal and not really growing then try harder, try to get into that deeper and see what, see how God shows up in that. I guess the caution there is it's not about trying harder, like behaviorally, it's just trying harder to dig deeper and search for God. And I would just say, lean into it more because I believe that Jesus draws near to us when we do that to him. Absolutely. Uh, Would you mind just closing us out for a word of prayer? Yeah, I would love to. God, we thank you for the opportunity to connect 
Um, I'm really thankful for the connection with Trevor and what he's doing here in this podcast. I'm thankful for the listeners. I pray that you would use some of these words to bless all of us um, and challenge us. Um, would you draw near to us as and we seek to draw near to you? And would you bless our efforts? Uh, be real to the people listening. Uh, be present and let them feel that and experience that presence that you have and grow that relationship with you. Uh, we couldn't do this without you, God. We know that you're in control. We know that you're working through our circumstances. We pray that you would be um, directing our steps. So I pray for the listeners here. I pray for this ministry, uh, that you'd bless it and help us to go out and serve you um, as we try to lead others and, and to serve others in this uniform. So yeah, we thank you and we praise you. We give you all the glory and we pray this in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. So anybody who's not already subscribed to Vodgrams on Instagram, go uh, give Aaron a follow and you can always DM and contact him there. Uh, is there any, anywhere else that people can get in contact with you? That's probably the best way. Okay. Send me a message. I'm happy to help out with sending Bible study ideas or anything and any way I can help. Awesome. Well, I mean, just some of my big takeaways from this podcast is, uh, you know, your story of going basically from religion to relationship and going into the military with that mindset of, of making disciples and living that out. And just some really good practical stuff about how to start a community, how to be involved and plugged into a Bible study. Just that wilderness journey that we talked about, taking advantage of the opportunities to share our faith and doing that faithfully and uh, just continuing to search and ask God to draw close to us. So uh, I really appreciate your time. Uh, I'm encouraged and I hope everybody else is encouraged by your story. So uh, hopefully to do this again soon and appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thanks for your time. All right. See you, Aaron. Thanks for listening to Thundering Legion. Don't forget to subscribe, leave us a rating and review. Please share this episode with another Armed Forces member who needs encouragement in their faith. Thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next episode.